Young women have been growing up with an indoctrination of what womanhood is and what it should be. They've been taught everything that is in direct opposition to the Word of God. Young women who want to be different from the world are rare, but they are real. On this Rare But Real podcast, Audrey Brogy will often be joined by her daughter, Grace Anna, and her daughters-in-law, Maureen, Kesset, and Marilyn, who desire to be discerning in a day when everything seems to go against God's design. Join them in the journey of becoming rare but real. It takes courage and conviction. And now, Audrey Brogy. Hey there, I am so glad to be recording this first podcast for the year 2023. And Actually, as I am sitting here doing this uh, podcast, I am alone in my home, and it's actually December the 31st, 2022, and I just had 25 people under my roof over the holidays. I should say Carl and I had 25 people under our roof over the holidays, and I can't even begin to tell you how great that was. Um I just think of them as, when I just said uh, 25 people, they're our people, they're our children, and our children-in-law, and our grandchildren, and I can't tell you how fun it was. Um, We even turned a garage into a bedroom for six girls, so it was like uh, camp, maybe, I don't know, dorm room, but they loved it. Um, I was able to get some cots in there and some um, mattresses on the floor, and they just thought it was the greatest thing. But um, not only was my house bursting at the seams, and it really was, especially because it was so cold, we kind of had record-breaking temps this time of year. And um, But so my house, yes, it was bursting at the seams, but so was my heart. Um, it was just so great um, hearing them laugh. It was great serving them. It was great hearing the stories that they told. It was great seeing the children play together and talk and laugh and, and uh, when when, when some of my granddaughters were leaving, I said, you know, if there was any drama, I didn't hear it. And they said, well, there wasn't much drama. <laughs> so, and they did a play for us. It was just so many things. Um, and housing them and even in preparation for everybody coming, I saw it kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Let's see, we'll put this couple here and we'll put this couple here and we'll turn this room into a bedroom. And basically I said, every square inch of my house was used for sleeping quarters except the bathrooms and the kitchen. Um, Anyway, but it was really great. And I was so thankful that um, seeing them all together and just seeing how God blessed our time. And I'm thankful for their flexibility. I'm thankful that they love each other and that they are on each other's team. I mean, we did the Christmas quiz that Carl always prepares and our house gets so loud when we're working on that. And we also had our time together around the Word of God. And I was reminded again as my husband was talking to our children and grandchildren and and telling them in the day we're living that the, our time, the time is getting darker, but it's all the more reason to walk with Christ and to be excited about the time that He has placed us here to live, to shine for Him. And He encouraged our family that it's not going to get easier to walk with Christ, but it will get harder. And He really imparted courage to them as he shared from the Word of God. And of course, we did gifts and all those kinds of things. And you know, I was reminded how too, as we close out this year, that I really want to run harder. Um, I want to run with more endurance the race that God has set before me. I think about all the things that have happened in this last year, even in my own life, And um, I don't know how much time the Lord will give me or, you know, we don't know how much time the Lord is going to give any of us in in this life. But I don't want to start looking to, uh, you know, take it easy. I don't want to start looking to um, slowing down to a slow pace the older I get. As long as God gives me health and strength, and even if he takes those things away, I want to run hard um, for him as long as he gives me breath. And another thing I was thinking about as I was uh, getting ready to record this podcast is we started it in Thanksgiving of 2021, and there are 52 episodes and 52 weeks in a year, and here we are closing out the year with um, 
well, I shouldn't say that because I'm recording on December 31st, but it will drop tomorrow on January 1st. And so as you're listening to this, it will already be 2023. And I'm just thankful for that. And um, I'm just thankful um, for all that God has done and what He will be doing. And just so you know, um, none of my girls are with me today. Um, I thought today I would um, use this time to remind everyone and myself of the theme for our podcast and what I we started it off with over a year ago and what I often remind my girls of. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of step through what I want to share with you today is stepping through Colossians chapter 2 the first eight verses, um, and just remind you of what God's Word says. And then um, I also want you to know that so many of you have written in. I have so many questions and so many topics that you all want to see us address. And so after today's uh, episode for 2023, then I'll be bringing in my girls, and I'll be recording with them, and we'll be tackling some of those topics together. And so, um, and, I, and I don't know, we'll, we'll try to work, or we'll have all of us on together, maybe, but I may just do it individually with them. It's so funny because Rick Forstner, who's the brainchild behind our podcast, had sent me a text and said, maybe when everyone's there, um, you can record a couple of podcasts. And I shared that with my girls and we all laughed and th- <laughs> because we thought about the, the uh, I don't know, what should I call it? The um, chaos at my house that it would just be impossible. It just seemed impossible to try to grab a quiet moment and record, especially when there's so many things that everybody wants to do when everyone is here. So we did not do that, but we are going to um, continue on this year and get lots of things in and topics. And as you know, it will always be centered around the Word of God because that's our lifeline. That is our anchor. That is our plumb line. That is what we hold on to for dear life. It's not so much what we think. At times, we'll share our opinions, but when we share our opinions, we'll say, that's our opinion. But it, everything that we do and what our heart is, is to hang our opinions on the Word of God. But also, sometimes the Word of God says things that we don't even like. And when I say we, I mean all of us as believers, not just um, me. Sometimes I I come, I come, read the Word of God and I think, I don't like that. I don't like what God's calling me to do. But, um, but because I love Him and because I want to walk with Him, I want to bring my life in line with what God's word says. But here we go as we as we started. In fact, I set my Bible down. So let me grab that um, because I want to read those first eight verses. And then I just want us to be reminded in terms of what the scripture says. And this is Paul writing to the church. And this is what he said in chapter two, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea and for all who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ." And then I want to go ahead and read the next two verses. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. I mean, this is what God's word says about Jesus Christ. And that's why all of us need to be captivated by him and to take our cues from him rather than from the world. And that was the heart of uh, of Paul. And as I just read in, in verse one, um, we see the greatness of Paul's struggle for these believers because he said, I have a struggle. How great. And I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. 
And he says, not only for those at Laodicea, but he's talking about all those, too, who have not personally seen his face. So his struggling was out of love, and it was not just for those he personally knew, not just for those he personally led to Christ. His struggle was for all believers. That's the kind of heart God gives you when you become a believer. And of course, we can see that from this verse. Paul wants the Colossian believers to know his heart. He cares about them, but he also cares for other people, those that he does not know. And that is one of the marks of a true believer. It's his love or our love, and I'll think of us as women, as a woman, is my love for all the saints, for all my sisters in Christ, even people I don't know. And Paul didn't just care about care about them. He really struggled for them. He experienced agony over them. And of course, we we can understand this word in terms of that agony or the struggle that he felt. It carries the idea of fighting, of wrestling, of persevering to take pains for other people, no matter who they are. Paul was wrestling for them. He is saying, what great conflict I have for you. And you know, I think about myself the older I get, the more I care about the young women who are coming up behind me, not just my kinfolk, not just my daughter, my daughters-in-law and my granddaughters, and but I care about other women. I care about the women who write to me and those of you who are listening to this podcast and are saying how much it has benefited you. And it's like, I want to help you. I want to give you, uh, I want to help impart courage to you to take courage from the word of God that you will stand firm in the day and age in which we live. And I want to take great pains for not only my own children and grandchildren to know the full assurance of understanding the mystery of God, but I want that for all any woman that God gives me the opportunity to influence, I want to be that kind of person. And of course, Paul expressed the same heart that he's expressing here in the first chapter in verse 29 when he says, for this purpose also I labor. I'm striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. And that's what he understands that it's not him. He's seeing that it's God who's working in, in him. Paul is struggling on their behalf, and he's struggling um, because he knows that there is so much heresy that was creeping into the church. He uh, wanted them to stand firm in the true knowledge of God, and that's what he was trying to get across to them. And then he says in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul's purpose, you see it here, is that their hearts may be encouraged, that their hearts may be knit together in love. And so we see the heart of Paul again, of what he cares about. It almost seems repetitive, but he wants them to know how much he cares that they are encouraged in heart. And of course, I've, I've used this phrase several times, even as I've been talking in this podcast, um, because the word encourage really does mean to impart courage to give courage to someone. And my, don't we need that today? You know, that's one of the things that Carl said to our family when um, we were sharing Christmas together, that it takes courage to live for Christ today. It really takes courage to stand firm. He was especially talking to our grandchildren as they're growing into, as they some of them are teenagers and they're growing in that way. He said, "If you know, it's going to be hard. It's not getting easier to live for Christ. It's getting harder, but you have to decide who you're going to give your allegiance to. And so that even myself as an older woman, I want to impart courage to you as a young woman, no matter who you are or where you live or what ages your children are, to stand firm on the Word of God, to um, let His Word give you courage. You're not going to get courage from you know, the world. You're not going to get courage from all of the voices that are out there, but you will get courage from the Word of God. And, and you know, that's one of the things that I've done so many times over the years when I've counseled women. I'm mostly telling them I'm, that God will be faithful in their circumstances. I encourage them to obey God even when it's tough. Sometimes I say it's not easy, but it's right in whatever the circumstance is that they are 
talking to me about. I try to give them courage to stay in a tough marriage. I'm not talking about a marriage where um, a, a man is hurting a woman. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about a hard marriage that it's, you know, when two people get sick of each other. I tell them to hang in there. I try to help them focus on God's purposes to get his purpose, to, to understand his perspective from his word and to show them that God will be with them. And so, so often in our day when women go through hard times, so many times, we think that the answer is just to escape the circumstances. That's always what we think. If I just weren't for these circumstances, everything would be fine. But the thing is, is God wants to impart courage to us in our circumstances so that we can stand up under it, so that we can become stronger through it. And God's way is to to give that courage so often is to keep fighting, to keep struggling, to keep working, to keep wrestling things out. But, you know, a lot of women don't really want to be encouraged in heart. So many of us like wallowing in our circumstances. We like to complain about it. We like using our circumstances as excuses in our lives. And so often we want someone to tell us it's okay that our responses to our circumstances are justified. But that's not true. That's not true. God wants to give us courage through our circumstances. Um, And, you know, when I was growing up, one of the best things my mother ever told me, and really she kind of ingrained it into me even as a young child, but she often said, sometimes, Audrey, you have to keep doing what you need to do even when you don't feel like it. And one time I was talking to her about that a number of years ago, and she said, oh, I hope I didn't like cause you too much stress with that. I said, just the opposite, Mama. You didn't cause me stress. You made me more courageous. You imparted courage to me even as a child, you know, and... And, and it was those times when she said, I know you don't feel like doing this, but you have to. You know, it's right to do this. And there's so many things in life that are right for me to do, even when I don't feel like doing them. I mean, think about it. I'm sure Jesus did not feel like going to the cross, but he did. And I can't tell you how much um, through the years that my mother's simple statement um, imparted courage to me to do what's right, to keep going, even when I didn't want to, or even when I didn't feel like it, or even when I didn't have the courage on my own to do it. And, uh, you know, so she doesn't even have to um, be with me now to say, to tell me these things, but it was ingrained in me. God's word says it like this, you know, think about it, Galatians chapter six, and let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Don't you love that verse? I mean, those verses, he says, while we have opportunity, we won't always have opportunity. You won't always have the same opportunity with your children that you have today while they are growing up around you. There's so many people that you have opportunity with right now, but you won't always have that opportunity. And he says, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And then when he adds, especially to those who are of the household of faith, he's talking about other believers. You know, and and the admonishment in those verses is don't lose heart in that because that's the temptation is to lose heart. The temptation is to grow weary. And that's why he's saying, you're going to reap. You're going to reap. Hang in there. I want to impart courage to you. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says it like this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. I mean, think about those of you who think about that verse for those of you who are like homeschooling and all the other tasks you have to do. He says, be steadfast, immovable. You know, people don't even like those words anymore. You know, they don't like to be people who are immovable, you know, who are, are have convictions, who stand firm, who don't bend with every wind of doctrine. They don't like people who have convictions. And But God says he wants us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, and abounding in what? In the work of the Lord, because our toil is not in vain. In the Lord. A lot of your toil can be in vain if it's not in the Lord. I mean, you know, it's vain for you to rise up early, to go to bed late, to eat the bread of painful labors. Unless the Lord builds a house, all of that stuff is vain. And so our toil needs to be in the Lord. And then um, 
First, Second Thessalonians says this, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And our, the world around us, they don't, they don't like to hear things like this. They like to say, well, just quit if it gets too hard. You know, or, or you can use every excuse in the book to quit, not to keep going. Because so often we respond to and we live by our feelings. We don't want to do hard things. If we don't feel like forgiving other people when they've wronged us, we don't. If we have a headache, we don't continue on and serve. We somehow believe that God understands our qu- our quit factor. But yet, you know, we all of us do what we really want to do. But it is accepted in the day in, w- in which we live to tell women because of so many of their circumstances, whatever their background is, that they can wallow in despondency. They can be victims. But we as women need to impart courage to other women. And those uh, those other women begin with those little women that God gives us in our home. You know, I think about my daughter-in-law one time, um, Kessid, when um, we were together and I, we were going somewhere, I, or maybe... I. I I can't even remember the circumstances, but I remember one of her little girls was kind of lagging behind and saying, oh, this is too hard. And I, I just remember Kessid saying, hey, be hearty, be hearty, keep going. And it just stuck with me because her, she was imparting courage to her little girl. She knew that her little girl could keep moving and she wasn't going to give in to her excuses of, of saying, this is too hard. She says, no, we're hearty. We're going to keep going. And I've always remembered that. It's, and it's a good example of this. Um, and we have to help people with this. Not only that, we have to be this way ourselves. We have to trust God even when things are hard and let Him impart courage to us because you know what the Bible tells us it says that his grace is sufficient for us he says that he helps the he helps us he comes to us in our weaknesses he's attracted you know gives grace to the humble the scripture says he says draw near to God and he will draw near to you and he is strong in our weaknesses And Paul says he wants their hearts to be encouraged because in spite of the heresy that was coming out them in every way, he wants them to be knit together in love. And that's what he says. And of course, the reason Paul wants their hearts to be encouraged and knit together in love is so that they will have all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. That's what he says in these verses. He says, you know, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. That is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, that's what he says. And think about the power of those words. And isn't it what we need in in today's um, time frame in which we live, the day of relativism, that, you know, where it's my truth, it's your truth, it's anybody's truth, truth is only truth if it's right for you, and it doesn't matter, anybody can be anything, you know, tell you, uh, your personal story, and that's your truth. But Paul says no, he wants them to have a full assurance of God's truth, the true knowledge of God's mystery. That's what he says in God's mystery, Christ himself. So here we go, back to the essence of of what Paul has been saying, that Christ is sufficient. He's above all things. If you know the book of Colossians, then you know that that's one of the themes of the book, that Christ is above all things. He is the true knowledge of God's mystery. If you have Christ, you have absolutely everything that you need. And why do you have all you need if you have Christ? Why? Paul tells us right here in the Word of God, because in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Don't you just love that truth? I mean, I love that truth. And I it makes me think of, of uh, Deuteronomy, um, I think it's uh, chapter 29, um, when this, the scripture says, um, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the works of this law. You know, when God was speaking those words to Moses to give to his people, he was telling his people, in essence, Um, of future things. He was talking to them about future things. God, at the appointed time, reveals himself to his people. And there were things in the, that the Old Testament saints did not know. It was a mystery to them. But yet, yet they believed God and they looked forward to God revealing this mystery. And the mystery spoken of in Colossians is this mystery of Christ. He was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, but those believers did not know his fullness the way we know him today in the church age. 
Christ, as the true mystery of God, reveals God to man. And it's such an amazing truth. I mean, John 1 verse 18 says this, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has, he has explained him. And then in Hebrews 12, um, excuse me, not 12, um, Hebrews chapter 1, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I mean, think about it. The mystery of Christ was a mystery, but at the point appointed time, God revealed this mystery. And he reveals this mystery to anyone who humbly comes to him. He lifts the veil and people understand. I mean, have you ever had opportunity to witness to somebody and they, they just didn't get it and you didn't know if they would ever get it? Maybe you explained the gospel over and over and over, but it was still like a mystery. It's like you kept reaching for ways to explain it. But then finally, it's like the curtain falls off of their eyes, the scales fall off of their eyes, and, and their eyes are opened and they understand it. And, and that's just the miracle of God working in their lives. It's the miracle of God revealing himself to them through Christ. You know, and, and you know, when I was a, a kid, I was very young when God revealed himself to me. And I can remember being so aware of my sin and knowing that I needed forgiveness. I didn't understand everything, but I understood enough to be saved. I understood enough that God saved me. This was God revealing the mystery of Christ to me, even when I was a young child. And he does that for so many children. You know, and he tells us, unless we become like children, we'll not enter the kingdom of God. I and mean, we have to humble ourselves to understand these things things. So often we think, well, my children won't understand it. You keep giving them the gospel and let God be the one to open their eyes and give them the understanding. You keep explaining it to them. You keep telling them every day in every way as you walk by the way, as Deuteronomy says, as you sit in your house, as you lie down, always be talking about the things of God and talk to them about God, how God is working. But God reveals himself for salvation. But you know what else is so great? He wants to reveal more of himself on every day, on a day-to-day basis. You know, one of the women that I've heard from in the last few weeks is, you know, she wants to know like day-to-day stuff. You know, walking with God day-to-day is your homeschooling. And what does that look like? How is that fleshed out? You know, almost she wants a, she wants an understanding of, of how a, a woman who's walking with Christ lives her days in whatever stage of life she is in. And we're going to be talking about that. We're going to get to some real uh, practical things as we as we uh, move through these podcasts this year. But here's the thing. God doesn't want us to remain babies, but he... But he wants us to grow up, and he wants Christians to experience intimacy with him. That's his heart for us. But so often the reason we don't experience intimacy with God the way he wants us to is because we don't obey what God has already revealed to us. I mean, that's the thing. It's so true. Walking with God hinges on our obedience to what he's shown us. I mean, you know, there's a passage in Scripture in Matthew's Gospel where um, the disciples come to Jesus and they're they're saying, well, why do you speak to these people in parables? Like, why are you talking to all these people in parables? Because as you know, if you know your Bibles, Jesus did speak a lot in par- parables and he told stories to them to help them understand. And Jesus, when he was asked this by his disciples, he said to them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given and he shall have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he ha- what he has shall be taken away from him therefore i speak to them in parables because while seeing they do not see and while hearing they do not hear nor do they understand and in their case the prophecy of isaiah is being fulfilled which says you will keep on hearing but you won't understand you will keep on seeing but you will not perceive for the heart of this people has become dull and their ears they scarcely hear and they have closed their eyes lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts in return and i should heal them but But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. 
you know, there's other passages that talk about these, the same thing. But what, what God is showing us that here is that God wants to reveal not only the mystery of Christ to us, but he wants to reveal the mystery of experiencing the depths of God in our everyday lives. As we do the laundry, as we're faced with um, a day where we um, feel like, I don't know, you wake up in the morning, it just seems like there's a cloud over you and you just have no energy to get anything done. And you say, you know, I need to do this, but I just don't feel like it. Or you're just like um, wallowing in self-pity or you're or you're bored or you're, you know, you just you're just tempted to just be lazy And we're not experiencing the depths of the Lord as we do the next thing that God has called us to do. But God wants us to walk with Him daily. But here's the thing. So what hinders us so often is our disobedience and our unbelief. You know, Proverbs 3.32 says this, For the crooked man is an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. I mean, let that sink in. He is intimate with the upright. Okay, so we know God wants to be intimate with us. And so the first step is through knowing this great mystery, Christ. First step is becoming a believer. First step is being saved. But then, once we're saved, God wants us to grow in sanctification. It starts the process of growing up in Christ. And you see this all over the New Testament when God talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling, when he talks about dying to self, when he talks about laying aside everything that it, that uh, is an encumbrance to us to running to how we ought to run. There's so many places where he talks about it, and that's what's called sanctification. And the way we become sanctified in our everyday experience is obeying what we know. That's what, you know, obey what you know. You don't know everything, but you know some things. Maybe God's shown you, you need to forgive that person. You're holding a grudge. You know, but God's shown you through his word that you're bitter. And so you need to release that bitterness. Or you're, God's shown you through his word that you do nothing but complain every day. Uh, complain about your circumstances. Complain about your husband. Complain about your children. Complain about your workload. Complain about your house. I mean, I don't, could be a number of things. I mean, I know what it's like to complain. You know, and and God wants to get a hold of that. You know, and he shows us through his word, do all things without grumbling and complaining. And I'm like, really? I have to do everything without grumbling and complaining? I can't do that. Exactly. I can't walk through life that way. But God, through his Holy Spirit, can do it through me. You know, he says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The desire of the flesh is to complain. The desire of the flesh is to be mopey. The desire of the flesh is to talk, um, gossip about other people or put them down, you know? (laughs) So when Paul wrote the Colossians, he knew there were were Jews who felt like the Gentiles were lower than the Jews. And so Paul's talking to them about that. You know, he's, he's talking to them about just everyday things. You know, uh, later in, uh, I mean, excuse me, earlier in Colossians, in verse 27, uh, Paul said, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what, what, what we're seeing here is that this mystery of Christ is available to anyone who believes and obeys. You know, he's intimate is with those who obey him. Do you ever wonder why you feel very far away from the Lord? Or you are very far away from the Lord? Could it be that you're not obeying him in the simplest things? Could it be that when you get up in the morning, your heart is not turned toward him? You haven't, you know, you're, you're just walking in the flesh. And so you're not, you know, intimate with the Lord. You haven't drawn near to him. You know, that's what he wants. You know, are you obeying him? Is there anything in your life that you're withholding from him? Because you will never know him in the riches of his glory, in the full assurance of understanding if you do not obey him. And I know Christians don't like to hear that today. We want to rationalize everything that's out there. We do not want to hold fast the faithful word. We want to lower the standard. We want to, in the name of uh, how our world calls it, inclusiveness and diversity and all these other things, but what they're really doing is lowering the standard of God's word. You know, you won't understand the full assurance of his mystery if you don't obey him. And the thing is, is you and I are the ones who miss out when we disobey him and we don't walk in obedience. God tells us in his word that he wants to pour himself lavishly on us. 
He wants us to understand his ways. He wants to reveal himself to us. I mean, I love John 14. Those of you who've known me and who've listened to me for years know this passage that I I harp on it in my own life all the time. But Jesus is talking to his disciples before he's going to go to the cross, and he tells them a lot in John, uh, it's really beginning in John chapter 13. But in John 14, verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. I mean, he'll live with us. He will abide with us. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I mean, do you see the heart of God in these passages? He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to make his abode with us. I mean, talk about a mystery. That that the sovereign king of the universe over all things, who has put all things under his feet, everything is under his feet. He wants to be intimate with me. He's the one who holds all things together, this whole universe. And he wants to be intimate with me. And he wants to be intimate with you. But you see here in these verses that I just read to you, he repeats himself over and over, who has my commands and keeps them. That's what he says. And he says, uh, if God, if we love God, we will keep his word. That's what he says. And he says the people who don't love him don't keep his words. It's just so encouraging to read his word. And even as I'm sharing this with y'all today, I'm so reminded. I'm like God is imparting courage to me as I'm walking through this. You know, you see the heart of God in these passages. We should never get over it. We should never get over the truth of God's word. And I love the way he says, if anyone loves it, loves me, he will keep my word. So the question comes, do we know his word? Are we in his word? Or are we just taking our cues from the world? I mean, you take the, the L out of the word world and you have word. And you stick that L in there and you've got world. you got to decide who you're going to listen to. How much are you reading God's word? How much are you asking God to help you understand it? Even the hard parts, even the parts that Break your heart when you, you know, and just know with our Bible reading challenge this year and at listening this morning and listening to what happens in the Old Testament when people are turning away from God and they're sacrificing their children. And it just reminded me this morning, I mean, I, I just wanted to push pause and weep to think about these women and what they were doing with their own babies. But again, I think, okay, they were doing that in the Old Testament, but look what women are doing to their own babies today. It's just so sad. But God shows us those things, and he wants to be intimate with us. He wants to to grow in our knowledge of him and to understand his word because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, we must know the truth, women. We've got to know what the Bible says, not just this the kind of women who are always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. No, we need to come to the knowledge of the truth. And of course, wisdom is the application of that knowledge to life. And both wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. And for some of you who are listening to me, you need to get the Search the Scriptures app. Not only would it be great for you to listen to my husband's sermons because he is a great Bible teacher and you will grow so much in Christ, but go to the link that says at the bottom, when you go to the app, it says, uh, there's a link there that says Woman's Life, or there's a tab. You click on that, and you will see a lot of the messages that I've taught in our women's ministry at Community Bible Church. And I taught, um, I called it Wisdom Calls, and I taught Proverbs 9, and I taught, uh, you know, so many from, from Proverbs, and it was all about what it means to walk in wisdom, because all of Scripture tells us Teach it, it shows us that the kind of knowledge and wisdom that we need is found in Christ, not in the foolishness of the world. Because we talked about how wisdom calls and foolishness calls, and you have to decide who you're going to listen to. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, For since 
in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. And they never will, not through the wisdom of the world. There is no, I mean, it's foolishness. But he says, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. I mean, think about that. Sometimes we're so afraid of sharing the gospel because we're afraid people are going to make fun of us, or we're so afraid to stand for Christ or to say things that are right. But you know what? You know, of course, people are going to make fun of it. The foolish people are going, they're going to sit in the seat of scoffers and they're going to scoff at the things of God. That's what they do. We should expect that and not be afraid of that. But here's the thing. There are going to be those people who are listening. That's what he says. That's what he says here. There, you know, to those who are called, who because God's calling people all the time, and it's going to ring true in their hearts. And, and the passage tells us, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, that's how they are going to understand it. So we have to remember that we're preaching Christ to those whom God is working in their hearts, and then don't worry about the scoffers, because there's always going to be scoffers. I mean, if they persecuted Christ and made fun of Christ and sent him to the cross, they're going to do it to us if we love him. I mean, that's what we have to remember, y'all. You know, even as you're preaching Christ to your children, they're saying, well, all the kids say this, or all my friends do this. Of course they do that, because they're following after the world. You have to impart courage to your children, and you have to be courageous in defending the truth to your children. They need to know that you stand firm on the Word of God, not that you're like out of balance and you're wobbly. No, they need to know that you're firm in the Word of God. You know, and we need to we need to remember this, y'all, especially in this new year in 2023, 2023, we need to be women who are courageous. I mean, God's looking for people of courage and people who will stand for him and not fade away and become um, nuanced in everything that they say. Yes, we want to be a we want to be kind and we want to be gracious, but we don't need to be afraid. You know, and then verse four in this chapter, uh, Colossians two, he says, I say this in order that no one delude you with a persuasive argument. I mean, he says, there's going to be arguments that are very, very persu- persuasive, and you will be tempted to listen to them. He knows that they're false teachers. He knows that heresy is spreading. He knows. And that's the same thing today. So many of the persuasive arguments sound good. I mean, think about Eve. The Bible says she was deceived. She listened to the surf- serpent's persuasive argument. And we have to think about that with ourselves. What kind of persuasive arguments do we listen to? Because the evil one is always ready to hold up the delicious fruit. (laughs) He's always always eager to make forbidden things seem attractive. He's never going to tell us that the end is death. He's not going to do that. And then Paul says, For even though I'm absent in body, nevertheless, I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. And then in verses 6 to 7, he says, As you therefore have received Jesus, the Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I mean, that's what he says, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel that you proclaim. Walk the way you, what you, what, I mean, walk according to what you say you believe. I mean, I know in Ephesians, he tells those believers, he says, try to, he says, trying to do what pleases the Lord. I mean, he, that should be our heart. We should not be running quickly to see how far, how close to sin we can get. We should be running far away to see how close to the Lord we can get. And, and God tells us in his word, that he will strengthen us with all power. That, you know, he told us, if you know Colossians, he says in the beginning, in the first chapter, he delivered us from the domain of darkness. He tells us that he's above all things and that through him all things hold together, that we're reconciled to him through Christ, even though we were fast running away from him. 
That's what he says. That's why it's a mystery. And then he says, so walk in him. And then verse 7 says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So in light of everything that Paul has said, he's telling these Colossians that the Christian life continues just as it started. Just as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So how did you receive him? You know, the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you know, and, and God saved us. We place our faith in him. I mean, that's what he says. And so, so living the Christian life is the same. You have to hear the truth, which is found in the word of God. You know, he says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what? Sometimes when I feel like I'm fading fast or when I don't have much courage or when I feel very, I mean, just insert whatever adjective is that you're feeling, you know where I'm going to find my strength? and my courage, and my just anything that I need is going to be in His Word. I mean, that you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's what girds us up. You know, it helps us get our heads on straight. So living the Christian life is the same thing. I don't feel like doing all that laundry. I don't feel like, you know, I don't know, insert what it, whatever it is that you don't feel like doing. But you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's going to help me do the things that I need to do. And His Word, that's why it's so important that we begin the day with the Word of God. I mean, we don't have to be legalistic about it, but the more you read the Word of God, the more you memorize it. It's not even like you have to go grab your Bible to read it because it's in you. And you ask the Lord to bring things to your mind. But now with all the technology that we have, it is so easy. I mean, in the mornings now, if I wake up early and my husband is still asleep, I can put my AirPods in and listen to the Word of God without ever getting up. You know, that's what's so great about those things without waking anybody up, you know. And of course, then we walk by faith. Living the Christian life is still by grace through faith. You know, we're saved is is by grace through faith. Walking with God day by day is by grace through faith. And, you know, Paul gave that same kind of encouragement in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, for if anyone comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Galatians 1, 6 says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Here's the thing. What I want you to see from this is Paul was telling all of these believers not to forsake the divine authority of the gospel for any persuasive argument. So how much are you listening to the persuasive arguments of our day? Just think about how much time you, 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 when you have time to watch a movie, to be, to hear the news, to watch TV or to read a book, how much of that is the worldly wisdom is persuasive arguments that stand in opposition to the word of God? And then how much of the word of God do you have? I mean, put it, you know, write it out, man, you know, it's kind of good. Some of these people use that screen time stuff, you know, to say, well, how you know, they think, oh, I, I wasn't on the, on the screens too much today. But if they're actually measuring it out, they say, oh, I actually was on there a lot. Now, of course, some of the screen time can be great because you're, you know, reading God's word on your screen. So I understand that. But all I'm saying is sometimes we think, oh, I didn't eat that much today. But then if we're writing it down and we're keeping a chart, we think, oh, I ate a lot today. I remember one time in my nutrition class in college when, you know, we were challenged to write down everything. And when I started writing down everything, I was like, whoa, You know, it's like, then it made me think twice because I had to write it down what I was going to eat and how much I ate. It was just an exercise to help us see that sometimes what we think is not actually happening. And so sometimes that helps us as believers. How much am I spending in God's word or listening to sermons by godly men of God or godly women who are teaching according to Titus chapter two from that lens? You know, and that, of course, here again, the exhortation in verse 7 is to be firmly rooted, because if we are firmly rooted in the Word of God, we're not going to be persuaded by good-sounding arguments. We'll be like, hmm, that doesn't sound right. Oh, mm, look at all the associations of that particular person. They've said a few good things that, you know, sound pretty good, but how do I, how do I know that? I mean, God just, God just puts His finger on things. Sometimes you can't even explain it. Ephesians 4.14 says this, that we don't want to be children who are tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Is that you? I mean, is that the kind of woman you are that you just hear a little bit here and you see this little meme over here and this woman who says this over here and you go, hmm, that sounds good. 
But God says well, that's what a child does. They're not rooted. They're not firmly rooted. And But children, and if we're little babies in Christ, we're carried about by every wind of doctrine, and there is no discernment. I mean, go back and listen to some of the podcasts we did last year on discernment. You know, that, that, that we have to be women who who know the word of God so we can discern all the women out there who are who are promoting so many things. I don't know. I'm not questioning their motives. Some of them are just don't know the Lord. Some of them are just very worldly, even though they claim to know the Lord. Others of them know, oh, if I can produce this and make a pretty book, I can make a lot of money. I mean, I don't know. But God does not want us tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. He doesn't want us carried around by the trickery of men. That's what he says in that verse. And by the crafty and deceitful scheming, because God wants us to be firmly rooted, built up in Him. He wants us to be established in our faith, and that only happens as we know God's Word and apply it in our lives. A lot of people know what the Word of God says, but they're not applying it. We have to apply it. Obey what you know, and as God reveals Himself to you, and He reveals more of His Word to you and shows you areas in your life that you need to put under His gracious authority, obey what He shows you, because, and then He'll keep revealing Himself to you as long as you keep obeying Him, and then you'll find that, you, you're very, that He's intimate with you. And so for some of you who are listening, God's brought you already during the, the as I look at the clock here, we've been on, I've been on 50 minutes on this podcast, and he's, um, he's brought you to a point of obedience, that, but you don't want to obey him. You know, you don't want to. You like this little pet sin, whatever it is. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't obey him, you're going to stop growing as a Christian. And not only will you stop growing, you're not going to stay uh, you're not going to stagnate. You're going to digress because you either go forward with the Lord or you start sliding away, drifting. You know, it, does t- it takes no effort to drift. You know, you start drifting and then you wonder why there's no joy. You wonder why you're always in a bad mood or you wonder why you're always depressed or you, you're not pressing on, why there's so much confusion in your life, why you're mad at everybody, why you fly off the handle at everything why you're always comparing yourself with other people, why you're not content, why you don't have any confidence in the Lord. It's because you're drifting. You're not walking with the Lord. God wants us to walk according to Christ. Now, remember, Paul's confronting the Colossian heresy there. And that's what's happening today. And that's why we have this book, because there's so much heresy today. And it was seeking to take those believers (laughs) away from Christ. And he tells us, in his word, that the evil one is the one who is the God of this world, and he wants to destroy the hope of every single Christian. He wants the Christian ignorant of the things of God. And so that's why Paul speaks so directly to these things. Okay, y'all, I guess I kind of preached on this podcast, but I want you to know that I was preaching to myself because I need this. I need this as I begin this year of 2023. None of us knows what this year is going to bring. Like We don't know if we're going to reach the pinnacle of happiness and joyfulness. We don't know if we're going to go through depths of sorrow. We don't know. But we do know that God wants to be intimate with us. He wants us to be firmly rooted in His Word, established in our faith. He wants our hearts knit together in love. He wants us to come to to the full assurance of the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. In Him, we have all we need pertaining to life and godliness. And I want to be one of those ladies, women, who's growing older. I, I want to be one of those women who not only grows older, but grows wiser. I want to walk with the Lord until He takes me home. And I want to impart courage to women all the days of my life. And I want to, to, I don't know, I just want to obey him and get rid of the things that he shows me that I need to let go of. I want to run fast toward him. And I invite you to join me in that. I invite you to, to run hard with him, to put aside every encumbrance, to let go of bitterness and anger and slander and malice and and you know, all the things that are are hindering you. 
I want to encourage you to walk by the Spirit so you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. You know, sometimes it's as simple as the desire of your flesh is to yell at your kids or to snap at your husband or just to be in a bad mood. You know, God says you walk with Him and you won't carry out that desire. You may be to tempt, be tempted with that desire, but God the Holy Spirit will impart courage to you to live for Him and to walk with Him and to choose to walk in obedience. So that's my prayer for myself this year. And in the podcast that follow this, you will hear from my daughter, Grace Anna, my daughter-in-law, Kessid, my daughter-in-law, Maureen. They are the, the heart of the Rare But Real podcast. Father, I am so grateful for the truth of your word, and I'm so grateful for this chapter, these first few verses in this chapter of Colossians, that you inspired Paul to write these words, and as relevant as they were for the believers in that day, they are so relevant for us today. And I pray for all the women who are listening to me that you would impart courage to them, that you would encourage their hearts that they would be knit together in love, that they would come to the full assurance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that if any of them have not come to know you personally as their Savior, that they would come to know you and grow in you. If you enjoyed this episode of Rare But Real, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when a new episode is posted. And share this podcast with friends. Follow Audrey on Instagram and Facebook at Mothering From The Heart. And listen to all her messages on the Search the Scriptures app.